today we're going to talk about why scuba gear so heavy. Was it always that heavy? Is it just the weight or do we have other issues in scuba? And can we make it better? So the first question is, why must scuba gear be so heavy? Well, it's heavy because it's buoyant. The problem starts with buoyancy. When you take the wetsuit and a BC and an empty tank, it is equal to a fairly large um, balloon that displaces a lot of water. And if you look at the average scuba kit, it actually displaces something like 70 pounds of water. And so if you want it to be neutral, the minimum weight that an average diver must carry is about 70 pounds of weight. And there's really no way around it because it doesn't matter if that weight comes from the weight of the tank itself or the BC, um, you have to add weight and you have to end up with about the same amount of total weight. And that's quite a bit of load on a diver. And then on top of it, you have the mass of air, of the compressed air in there. So average divers today carry about 70 to 75 pounds. And that's a lot. And to know how much that is, it will show you or not. There we go. OK, so how much weight is too much? So other industries looked into it um, a lot. They wanted to see what is, when do people feel that weight is very heavy? And the total load on a person is usually 20% of your body weight. So if you calculate your own body weight and you take 20% of it, that's about where you want to be comfortable. Anything above it starts to become exponentially more difficult. And this was proven, it's called the Borg scale. It's been around for many, many years. Um, and it's been used by many different industries. And we, as an industry, are somewhere between the nope and not worth it when you look at the amount of weight that we're carrying on ourselves. And it's been acceptable for many decades. It's been, that's how it is. And every other outdoor industry was racing towards lighter weight, uh, skiing, mountain biking, climbing, you, you name an industry, everybody is trying to get the weight to be reduced. And so the first thought here was, let's go back and look at what scuba used to be. In the very early days of scuba, when you had just a regulator and without a VCD, you just went into the water and you had to be about six pounds negative because throughout the dive, you're gonna consume about five pounds of air and you're gonna end up about neutrally buoyant. And so when you dive like that, it's not comfortable. To be six pounds heavy is not comfortable and it's not safe. And the reason for that is because we all know that we have a tidal volume. That's how much volume you replace. So when you're all sitting here right now, you are exchanging about 500 milliliters of air. This is an average, and that is your tidal volume, which translates to about one pound of buoyancy. And that's the comfortable breathing pattern. When you start six pounds heavy, you can see the imbalance in forces on a diver. But towards the end of the dive, The, there was this magical moment where the forces balance each other and you're in the zone. Everything is awesome and you, you feel neutrally buoyant. Mm -hmm. And in those early days of diving, when you reach that point, that was the magic because no matter how much you go up and down, it was beautiful. Now, that only lasted for the last few minutes of the dive. And so to fix that came the BCD, which we all know. And the BCD is an inflatable vest or an inflatable device, and that added a lot of buoyancy, which required us to add more weight. And so the biggest problem was that it added a lot of compressible volume. When you look at the compressible volume, in today's BCs, and this is calculated, you're usually carrying something between five and eight um, pounds equivalent of buoyancy which is a fairly large volume. That air pocket that you have on you, the larger that air pocket from any reference depth, the larger the expansion and the larger the force that it's going to generate, even for small amounts of um, depth change. Whereas when you have smaller volume, you don't generate that much um, 
buoyancy change. When you look at the ratio between the tidal volume and the change of buoyancy, and what this air pocket that we're all carrying on ourselves um, is, that ratio causes us to get out of balance very quickly. As soon as you start to ascend a little bit, it starts to pull you because it's a compounding effect, or you go down. And we got used to it. We developed all of our certification program in neutral buoyancy, and it sort of became a non-issue because this is what we teach people. That's the model that exists right now. When you look at that, there is something that you can derive from it, if it would work. There we go. Um, which we call the zone of stable neutral buoyancy, which means how many feet can you ascend or descend before you have to touch the gear and without playing any games with your, um, like you don't have to get out of your comfort zone with breathing. And with standard scuba today, it's a very narrow zone and we all know that. You can only go so many feet up or down before you have to touch your gear and you get out of the zone. And neutral buoyancy today is very unstable. We are neutrally buoyant. Every instructor here, you know, we teach neutral buoyancy. You're neutral at a point, but you're not stable. The zone of stable neutral buoyancy actually has respect to the compressible volume. So the smaller the compressible volume, the wider that zone becomes. And that is intuitive to anybody to teach. That's why we tell them not to take that much weight. But you want to be in the small compressible volume. And so that explains why on the on these early days of scuba towards the end of the dive with very minimal compressible volume, which was the suit, they had a very, very big zone of stable neutral buoyancy. So small compressible volume gives you ultra stable neutral buoyancy. One of the questions that come up immediately is what about the wetsuits? Wetsuits are compressible volume, and we live under this impression that wetsuits compress a lot. Well, we dove with hundreds of different wetsuits and took them to um, a lot of depths to see if this is actually true, and it's not. A wetsuit, as you all know, is neoprene. It's a closed cell neoprene. That neoprene, the rubber, the rubber itself, limits the compression of how much compression you actually get. And so, and within it, you have gas that doesn't allow the suit to compress that much we found that even 10 millimeter wetsuits will only lose between three and four pounds on a, on a descent that is very deep. And so wetsuit and even very thick ones are a very minor compressible volume. They're not anywhere near what a BC compresses. The BCD is not really needed to compensate for wetsuits. It compresses for itself because you have to fill it because you're going into the water six pounds heavy because you're gonna end up the dive um, or you need to reach neutral buoyancy towards the end of the dive. And that is something that we're all diving. That's how we're diving today. When you look at us as, a, as an industry, the philosophy so far was to add more stuff. So we start with a tank, we add weight because we know we're gonna have the air and we're gonna consume it. And so to compensate for that, we added a BC and we're ending up with ourselves as a lift bag and a weight, and we manage it with our very little tidal volume, which is our lungs. Um, that ends up in a very unstable form of neutral buoyancy. And so the thought was, what if instead of all this, what if instead of keeping adding buoyancy and adding weight and adding more buoyancy, what if we could simply remove buoyancy from the tank itself? If you know, that the source of the problem is that the diver loses mass throughout the dive. How about we'll have a tank that can lose buoyancy? A simple tank that just loses buoyancy as, as you lose mass, the tank itself loses buoyancy. There we go. That was the moment that we said, okay, the, the implementation of that solution of a tank that can change just its own volume can be a tank that has an internal bladder that you inject water. It's gonna achieve the same goal. In fact, it's gonna achieve more than that. It provides flotation because it can be a very lightweight tank to begin with because you can add water and thereby reach neutral buoyancy. So on the surface, it's gonna be a very lightweight tank. Um, you can use ambient water for buoyancy adjustment like submarines do. You don't really need weight. And 
the most important thing that we discovered was that it does not change buoyancy like a BC as a result of ambient pressure. So you're independent from ambient pressure. The system that was developed around it is the hydro tank and the jet, the jet pack. The hydro tank is shown on the left. It's a carbon fiber tank. It's very light. You can touch it. We have it in the booth and lift it. Um, and it's a tank that has a bladder inside that occupies the entire inner volume of uh, the tank when you start the dive. And you can introduce water from the bottom of the tank by pumping it in. To do that, you have a pump. This is our jetpack. It's an aluminum backplate that has a pump on the left and a battery on the right and a simple manual on-off button. This system is not automated. It is manual. On the left, you have a purge valve that allows you to purge water out of the tank. And so the pump is used to put water into the tank and you know lose buoyancy or become heavier. And the purge valve is used to remove water from the tank and is separate from the power. You don't need power for that. The way that the system comes together is you simply put the tank on the jetpack. The connection between them is a, this hydraulic hose that connects the two. And over the last three years, we've been diving this in Maui. Uh, in the beginning, it was done in complete secrecy because the first time that we got the first prototype, we already saw the advantages of this. And so it took some time to work. And in this time through COVID, we were working on DOT and CE and we got both. Um, so the system right now is DOT and CE approved. And let's look at how this whole thing works. So you're jumping into the water and you're lightweight because the tank itself is buoyant. This is again, a carbon fiber tank. Um, you bob on the surface, just like you would now. Again, there's no weight. And when you're ready to go, you press the button that I just showed you, and it will introduce water into the tank. Um, putting water in a tank is a much more efficient way than using weights, because weights themselves have their own buoyancy. It's not a lot, but it's compounding. Putting water in the tank, you lose buoyancy, and it's one-to-one. -one. When you're ready to go, you free dive. There, you're neutral and you go free diving. You actually swim down until you reach your maximum depth and then you just dive. There's no adjustments. And again, the system is not um, automated. It doesn't need to be. We took away the whole compressible volume. So you dive up that for about 20 minutes until you consume about one pound or one and a half pounds, just enough for you to feel the difference because again, our tidal volume is about one pound of buoyancy. And so when you reach that state, all you need to do is you press the button again and it will introduce another pound, two pound and a half of water into the tank and you have another 20 or more minutes of perfect neutral buoyancy regardless of depth and regardless of, of uh, depth change. And then you swim. The animation is a little slow. <laughs> and you swim more. Um, one of the beauties of the system is that there's no rapid buoyancy changes. Divers, even new ones, would go up and you just swim up and there's no change in buoyancy. Um, when you reach the safety stop, you simply stop. You just stop swimming. When you stop swimming, you hover. Um, safety stop, there will be no more blown safety stops um, with systems like that. When you're done, you reach the surface, and the last thing you typically do in a dive is you just purge the water that you had through the dive. We typically don't touch that purge valve through the entire dive. And you know now you're more buoyant by five pounds um, towards the end of the dive, and it makes it even lighter to go into the boat and to end the dive. So. As I said, we've been working on this for a while. Um, this is uh, what we learned over more than 1,000 dives, and now we're approaching 2,000 of um, cumulative dive time with many, many different divers through a pilot program, is that this is a lot more intuitive for any level of diver. 
um, lung control becomes second nature in minutes. What happens today with a BC is that you have a noise and you have a signal. Your lungs are the signal. Every diver that you put in the water without a BC will instantly be able to control um, with something like that. They have the signal of the, the lungs and it's very easy to calibrate your neutral buoyancy too. As soon as you put compressible volume them, you just introduce a large signal and now you need to teach them how to deal with this, with, with this noise, that is the BCD. So lung control becomes second nature in minutes. Uh, air consumption significantly improves. Before you go beyond that, can I make a comment? Yeah. When you look at this area especially, one of the things that I do is I do presentations on the older diver, being a representative of the older diver population. Uh, when you look at these, uh, all of these things make it easier for an older diver, especially when you have a cylinder that's much lighter weight uh, coming out of the water, getting into the water, just moving from where you put your equipment on and into the water. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. Plus also people who are coming back to diving after having been away for a long time. One of the things we experienced in COVID where people had been out of the water for two years, three years or longer, or people who decided for some reason or other not to dive for a period of time, coming back and using a system like this makes it a lot easier and safer to get back into the sport. So after we conducted our own dives and our own experimental dive team started diving with it a lot, and we know what we had. As soon as you see so many instructors and especially very experienced divers, dive shop owners coming out of the water one by one, telling you we never want a dive standard again, we decided to talk to experts. And so we invited Dan Orr um, to come in and then go for it. Well, one of the things that I did, it was actually almost a year ago when I first heard about this system. I was at the DEMA show in the United States and went to the presentation that Aviad gave. And he started the presentation and then started talking about the benefits of the system. And I looked around the room and it was filled with diving professionals and instructors and they were all shaking their head, no, this is never gonna work. Um, and I had a lot of questions myself. And so after that, I went and talked to him. One of the things I told him was it's, it was really refreshing to see something really new and innovative rather than seeing the same thing over and over again, except in a different color. Um, so one thing I did was we talked a lot and I said, you know, I really would like to know more about it because having been at Divers Alert Network for all of those years and having been a diving professional for all those years, I was really concerned about safety and I wanted to make sure this system would work, even in the worst case scenario when nothing worked at all. So I was invited to go to Maui and went to Maui and had an opportunity to do a series of dives. In fact, there's a photo taken of me with the equipment on. Um, it was a tough place to go, having to go to Maui to dive <laughs> this equipment. And I saw a whale shark on that first dive. Uh, so it was really a great, uh, great system. But when you look at diving accidents, and a lot of us do review accident reports, a lot of times when things happen and go wrong and things fail, they fail dramatically and they fail very quickly. And that's entirely different than what happens with the Avella system. So when you look at possible malfunctions, for example, using traditional equipment, uh, if you have something that does create positive buoyancy very quickly, and a lot of the training programs that we have nowadays really don't tell students or show students or give students the opportunity to learn how to deal with a rapid uncontrolled ascent. Uh, so when you have a situation like that where you would potentially lose weights or you have a power inflator that got stuck because you didn't maintain it properly, or you had a rapid ascent, uh, then you have a tremendous amount of buoyant force pushing you towards the surface, and you have a rapid and generally uncontrolled ascent. When you have a similar situation where you become positively buoyant with the Avella system, and that would be due to a water leak, that takes a long time. It's not rapid and dramatic. It takes uh, a number of minutes, in fact, for you to notice any change whatsoever. And even when that change happens, it changes you to be where you're very rarely out of neutral buoyancy. Then if you have the other situation where you, for some reason or other, are too heavy. And when I, when I thought about this, I actually remember seeing a video not too long ago where a young lady uh, was uh, with a group of divers and she was weighted like a lot of divers are. And at the end of the dive, she was concerned about having that rapid ascent as she was gonna go to the surface. So before she started her ascent, she dumped all of the air out of her BCD, which made her negatively buoyant. And you can see her in the video struggling at the bottom, kicking, not going anywhere while, while everybody else is going to the surface uh, and controlling their buoyancy. And all of a sudden she panicked and came to the surface. Well, in a situation like this, uh, you have negative buoyancy in this case caused by possibly a compromised buoyancy compensator 
where you have a downward or negative force uh, that makes it very difficult for you to get back to the surface. It significantly increases the stress on you and therefore can lead to panic. With the Avello system, you'd have something that's caused by water overfill where there's more water uh, in the system. And what that does, that creates a downward force, but generally only a couple of pounds. So you're very rarely out of neutral buoyancy. So even in the worst case scenario, when things are not working, uh, you don't have any rapid and dramatic changes. Okay, what happens if the system itself doesn't work? Uh, and that's the other thing I wanted to know. And the other thing I wanted to try out when I was actually diving the system, and that is if you have, for example, the battery doesn't work, or you have a situation where the bladder that contains your breathing gas is compromised for some reason or other, uh, nothing happens that's rapid and dramatic. Nothing is going to seriously affect or compromise your safety. And so just like anything we talked about a few, few minutes ago, if something does happen, it doesn't happen quickly. And it doesn't happen in a situation where all of a sudden you're out of control. Okay, so, you know, before we go into this, the bladder is a, is a big deal because people ask us all the time about, that's the first question that we get is, what happens if the bladder is compromised? Well, in the early days of this, we simply perforated our own bladders. We took bladders, we put holes in them, and we compressed them with air at a high pressure. We went high to 300 bar. Um, and went there and stood and waited for, you know, the mushroom cloud to happen and there was nothing. So we took it into the water and started diving with it. And again, there was nothing, there's no effect. Because just like um, Dan said, the bladder is captive, it's inside the tank. Air, a bit of air comes out, it saturates the water. And as a diver, there's no effect on you. You can still complete the rest of the dive with a compromised bladder. Um, not that we recommend it, but what we're saying is, is that the bladder was never an issue, even when we, started to like cut holes in it and cut like diamond shapes in it and really started to cut like slots in it to see what happens if it's compromised. Um, those bladders are tested to 85,000 cycles, uh, which will be several decades of uh, use of the tank. And the bladders stand an immense compressive force. The, those, those things are designed for um, application well beyond the standards of scuba. And that's it. So. Oops, oops. <laughs> we went too far. Come on. Okay. The entire system was designed to be an open water system or an open circuit system that is compatible with current industry standards. It's the hydro tanks are typically filled to about 200 bar. However, they are a 300 bar tank. And if you have that much air, then they will be 106 cubic feet or 3,000 uh, liters. So they do provide 33% more air or more gas than a standard scuba tank. Um, they are DIN valves, which they like, um, and we all do. Um, they are compatible with enriched air, um, same as regular standard. Hydrotex is every five years, visually inspected every year. We recommend that the bladder will be replaced when needed or every five years. Uh, it's rated to a considerable depth and it fits within the current infrastructure. And that was very important because any dive shop can adopt this almost immediately. To do that, we work with dive shops um, through an Avello Dive Center agreement. We provide a product. Again, as I said, it's a DOT and CE. Um, we developed our own diver education program. This is hydraulics. It's suddenly introducing hydraulics into scuba. It's something that never existed in scuba. Um, and there are a lot of advantages to control your buoyancy hydraulically that are above and beyond what we've done so far because the scuba industry essentially is a pneumatic industry. We use air pockets. Um, and so it does require an education program that tells you how to use this type of system. Um, we developed our own instructor education programs that do follow the ISO standard that we just talked about before. Um, and we also serve, we also um, certified service technician. And our plan is next year, we're gonna start offering this as trips. There's something that we call the Avello experience. It's gonna happen on Maui. It's gonna be a week long dive or five days of diving, but a week long vacation where the first day is gonna be your recreational Avello diver. We're calling it the RED program. And 
you get certified on the first day. It's only, it's a specialty. It's only for already certified divers. And then you spend five days um, diving the system. And that's it. We, we're here because we're starting to collaborate with the rest of the scuba industry. Um, we are already working with Scuba Pro um, on a project and we'll give more detail on that. There's several other manufacturers that we're working with and the scuba industry took note of this after DEMA last year and through this year, we started to create more and more collaborations and we are open to collaborate with anybody. We understand how big of a change that is. And so we are reaching out right now.